Hey everyone, welcome back to The Dabbler's Den. I'm Chris Cottrell, and today I want to share a quick response to one of Antonio Zamora's recent videos titled, Carolina Bay's Time of Emplacement. You know, over the years, Antonio and I have agreed on many things when it comes to the Carolina Bays, but in light of some new evidence relating Paleo-Atlantic shorelines to the Carolina Bays, we've come to a disagreement as to the timing of the Bay's formation. You know, maybe a, a little bit of an entertaining debate, if you will. Uh, Zamora maintains the claim that the bays were formed at the onset of the Younger Dryas some 12,900 years ago, which I agreed with for so long. But now I believe that this new line of evidence suggests a formation date somewhere between 400,000 years and 1 million years ago. Um, as I've said in previous videos, I know that this isn't a popular hypothesis. But please keep in mind that science is not a popularity contest. You know, we have, we have to follow the evidence because the truth is out there. And at this point, we owe it to ourselves to see it through. And to be honest, it's, it's almost like we're debating which shade of purple smells the best. Because as of right now, none of this has been accepted by the mainstream scientific community. Uh, before that can happen, you know, us rogue independent Carolina Bay researchers need to be a solid united front with the kinks already worked out. Um, so we might as well have fun with it and, and pull out all the stops. Now, let's start by taking a look at the big picture. Zamora and I both agree that the Carolina Bays and Nebraska rainwater basins are not created by persistent wind and water processes during our most recent ice age, which is the current scientifically accepted hypothesis for, these for, for their formation. Uh, the unique mathematically elliptical shape, orientation, and alignment of all of these depressions literally point to an initial cometary impact into an ice sheet over the Great Lakes region at some point in our past. Now, I believe, and I'm not sure if Antonio supports this or not, but I believe that the Michigan Basin is a direct result of that initial glacial impact, and the bays and bases, basins were formed as the icy ejecta from that impact came crashing back down to the earth. Now, you guys should definitely go, uh, go back through both mine and Antonio's uh, back catalog of videos if you want any more information on any of that. Now, as, as I said, it's the timing that has always been the issue. And, you know, I, I recently poked that hornet's nest uh, with some new and pretty darn compelling evidence that may push that timing back. Uh, this is a LiDAR image of the Myrtle Beach area, and as we can see right away, there are lots of Carolina Bays here. All of them are perfectly shaped, despite their size and location. All are perfectly aligned, and all are perfectly oriented to one another. And once you begin to look closer, you'll notice that some bays in this image show more extensive erosion than others, and there are even a few areas where you don't see any bays at all. You know, as you can see right here, lots of erosion, lots of erosion almost zero bays within this area right here. Um, you'll notice that these areas are highlighted by different colors, and that means that they are at slightly different elevations from one another using the LiDAR. Now, what I did was use marine oxygen isotope data from the Greenland and Antarctic ice cores to match relative sea level stages to ancient shorelines along the east coast of the United States. The results were profoundly interesting. You know, I found that the last time the sea level was higher than it is today was around 125,000 years ago, where the ocean reached nine meters or 30 feet higher than it is today. Uh, you know, right here, 125,000 years ago. Um, the time before that was 400,000 years when the seas were 42 feet higher than they are today, right here. And the time before that was 1 million years ago when the sea level was 69 feet above our present sea levels. And that's all the way up to here. Now, so going back to our LiDAR image, you know, this whole area, all the land that you see here uh, is under 69 feet in elevation, meaning that everything you see in the terrain here was created within the past 1 million years um, as the ocean receded from that whole entire area, leaving the land high and dry. 
Then, 400,000 years ago, the sea level rose to this point right here. Uh, you know, again, that's 42 feet above our current sea level. You'll notice that uh, this is the area where we see the more heavily eroded Carolina bays. Um, the ocean receded back once again. Uh, then 125,000 years ago, the seas rose for the second time in the past 1 million years to 30 feet right here, uh, to 30 feet above our current sea levels, affecting this area where we see almost zero bays. And it's like this all up and down the East Coast. This isn't an isolated case. If the bays were formed 12,900 years ago at the onset of the Younger Dryas, when sea levels were way, way on out there, way out here, then um, we would find them all over this area where we find none. We would find them all over the place here. We don't. The only difference uh, in the terrain here is you know, just a few feet of elevation. That's it. Uh, now, this evidence supports a direct relationship between the Carolina Bays and these past sea level stages. I'll also add, you know, because I keep seeing this pop up in the comments, that hurricane storm surge and tsunamis wiping out the Carolina Bays over the past few thousand years when sea levels were high enough to affect them is not supported by any form of evidence, including archaeological records up and down the East Coast. Um, so so that, that's not the case here. All right, now in Antonio Zamora's video titled Carolina Bay's Time of Emplacement, you know, which, which he did create after hearing the evidence that I just discussed, uh, he, he creates a list of requirements that must be satisfied in order to identify a formation date for the Carolina Bay's. Um, it's a good start, and, and of course I do agree with this list. Uh, and the first two do kind of pretty much go hand in hand. Uh, number one, there has to be an extraterrestrial impact on an ice sheet that covered the Great Lakes region. And number two, that, that the convergence point of the bays has to have been covered by an ice sheet. So basically, you know, the Carolina Bays were created by glacial ice ejecta, and there had to have been an ice sheet over the Great Lakes area at the time of the initial impact. Okay. All right. So we got that. Now, this graph uh, used by Antonio in his video uh, shows the Earth's temperature record over the past one million years, which is perfect. Um, he's also done us a huge favor by uh, superimposing important dates and uh, time intervals that are being that are being discussed here. Now, the Younger Dryas impact event occurred right here. And uh, let me just reiterate for, for just a second here that I do absolutely believe that there was an impact event right at 12,900 years ago over the North American ice sheet. There, there is tons of evidence now to support that. The question here is whether or not the Carolina Bays were formed at that time. You know, and, and we'll talk about this more here in a few minutes. Um, obviously, Antonio does think that the bays were formed at the YD boundary and um, that there was plenty of ice over the Michigan area, you know, for an impact to form, you know, to form the Carolina Bays. Now, yes, there are one or two papers that support this idea, but honestly, you know, a vast majority of the literature on the topic does not support that. Um, you know, which, which makes this an incredibly gray area and one of the main reasons that the scientific community won't get behind it. You know, a lot of scientists in that area claim that there was no ice over that part of the Great Lakes area at the end of our most recent ice age, you know, the, the onset of the Younger Dryas. Now, I'm saying that the Paleolithic shorelines indicate, a, you know, a Carolina Bay forming impact occurring any time between 400,000 years uh, ago, you know, which is right here, uh, and 1 million years ago, all the way to the end of this graph, you know, so that's, that's one really bad day any time within that 600,000 year period of time. Um, I have suggested that one of the more plausible dates to look at is right here, you know, at the 7,806, I'm sorry, 786,000 years ago, uh, proposed by Michael Davis and Tim Harris. You know, Antonio implies that because that point in time occurs during an interglacial period, that there wouldn't have been an ice sheet over the Great Lakes area. And I strongly disagree with that. Uh, just because we don't have an ice sheet over the North American continent during our current interglacial uh, period does not mean that, 
that there wasn't one during earlier interglacials. You know, especially during this time span between 400,000 years and a million years ago, you know, as you could see, the records indicate that temperatures didn't come even close to our most recent interglacial temperatures. Uh, and if you want, if you want a more modern analog to prove that continental ice sheets can survive extreme interglacial warming periods, you know, just look in Antarctica today. You know, there is tons of ice there despite our modern coal-fired power plants and gas-guzzling SUVs. And, you know, something else that I want to uh, point out here is that Antonio uses radiocarbon and optically stimulated luminescence dating to maintain his notion that the time of emplacement for the bays can't be older than a certain time. And, you know, we've already determined that while these dating methods do a great job dating material found within the bays, they, they do not help with the change in the terrain itself. So, you know, we can't have it both ways here. You know, it's either one or the other. So, okay, so we can cross out Antonio's first two requirements um, if if we're trying to make comparisons here, you know, there is nothing saying that there wouldn't have been an ice sheet over the Great Lakes region uh, where the Carolina Bays and Nebraska rainwater basins converge, you know, during the time span between 1 million years and 400,000 years. Uh, and in fact, you know, there is more evidence going against the idea that there was ice covering that area at the onset of the Younger Dryas. Uh, but, you know, I digress on that point. You know, how about uh, how about his third requirement? Um, that the time of emplacement must be associated with an extinction event. Now, keep in mind that I do believe that a fragmented common affected the North American ice sheet 12,900 years ago. So the late Pleistocene megafaunal extinction is likely impact related and a very real thing. You know, and again, the question is whether or not the Carolina Bays have anything to do with this, this event. Up until very recently, uh, the peak in megafaunal extinctions, you know, right at the Younger Dryas boundary has been attributed to Paleo-Indian paleo -Indian overhunting, uh, which, which I think we can all agree is outdated and kind of ridiculous at this point. Uh, but it does prove that we are just now starting to understand our most recent extinction event, one that nearly added humans to that list. Now, the chart Antonio uses only goes back 56,000 years, you know, and the, the Paleo-Atlantic shoreline suggests the Carolina Bay is formed any time between 400,000 and a million years ago. So that's, you know, that's a really long time ago, and there has been very little research done on megafaunal extinctions going back that far, um, you know, which, which kind of brings to mind Carl Sagan's quote, you know, that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So, uh, you know, with that said, though, there is a mass extinction event recorded within the time frame the Paleo-Atlantic shorelines suggest, and it lines up perfectly with the plausible impact date proposed by Michael Davies and Tim Harris. The mid-Pleistocene transition extinction took place right around 800,000 years ago, and based on sediment cores, is responsible for a loss of over 20% of our benthic foraminifera of the time. You know, any event serious enough to knock out such a large percentage of microscopic ocean bottom dwellers uh, is bound to have a profound effect on megafauna, uh, both at sea and on land. Uh, you know, we, we haven't, we just haven't gotten there in the research yet. You know, so yes, you know, I absolutely agree with Samoy here that you know, this extinction event is is an important part of the time of emplacement. So that brings us to the final requirement on his list, that the bays had to have been formed relatively recently to endure the effects of erosion. And this, I believe, is his weakest argument, as it's based mostly on speculation and not actual evidence. You know, in, his, in his video, Antonio compares um, the, the very first aerial images to the Carolina Bays taken back in the 1930s, uh, to a more recent Google Earth image um, that's in black and white to make it a to make it a fair comparison, you know uh, Zamora states that the reason you see fewer bays in the more recent image is because uh, they are rapidly being erased due to erosion. I would argue, you know, very strongly, in fact, that the reason we perceive fewer bays has nothing to do with the rate of erosion, but quite the opposite. 
you know, an actual increase in vegetation over, over time uh, reduces the rate of erosion. Now, keep in mind that the original 1930s image, uh, images were taken in the midst of one of the country's worst environmental and economic disasters, the Dust Bowl. And as you can see in the images, you know, the bays here were probably the most exposed they had been for thousands of years uh, during, you know, during that time of the Dust Bowl. And, you know, and since then, environmental conditions have improved greatly, uh, leading to an overall increase in ground cover. And in 1989, this entire area was turned into the Lewis Ocean Bay Heritage Preserve, you know, ensuring that the bays will be around for many, many, many years to come. Now, one thing these comparison images do tell us with absolute certainty uh, is that the greatest threat to bay integrity, other than the ocean itself, uh, is the encroachment of human development. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up here. You know, I, I've gone through the list of requirements named by Antonio Zamora himself to demonstrate that the time of Carolina Bay and Nebraska Rainwater Basin emplacement can very well be within the time frame that the Paleo-Atlantic shorelines indicate. Uh, and, and that this new line of evidence needs to be carefully considered. Now, as I've said before, you know, if, if you can prove me wrong here on this, you know, fantastic, great. You know, please do so. Just make sure that you do it with actual evidence. You know, speculation and assumptions can only go so far. You know, and speaking of which, uh, there is going to be a part two for this topic. Um, there was one, one thing mentioned in Zamora's time of emplacement video that had me scratching my head. And, and I've been giving it a lot of thought, and I think I, I have figured this out, but I'm, it's, it's still a little too much on the speculation side for me uh, to add to this video right now. Um, so stay tuned for part two uh, to see what I'm talking about. Um, share this video, join the debate in the comments, uh, and we'll catch you guys next time. All right, bye. Oh, and for the sake of argument, dark purple smells the best.